Welcome back to episode two in Data Science for Everyone. I am so excited that you are here. I am Professor Jonesroy. This is one huge overview picture of what I mean when I say, hey, when we're data scientists, we need to think like scientists. So we're going to talk through an example. It's going to be mostly using words and ideas. Uh, if we were in real life in a classroom, I would be asking you for your input. So feel free as you're watching this to shout out uh, at home or wherever you are in the airport, at a restaurant, uh, shout on out uh, ideas you have as I go. For example, one thing that we might care about as a data scientist is why some countries are wealthier than others. As I said in the previous video, my own background is in social science, and so a lot of the examples in this course will fall along those lines. But uh, this is something that scientists, social scientists, most of us have thought about, right? You walk around a new city, you walk around your own hometown, and you say, gosh, um, why do some people have all the wealth and some people do not? This will not be a treatise on late stage capitalism. This will be an effort to think about how we might empirically go about answering this question. So using data, how might we answer this question? Well, first, in order to do anything, we need to start to ask things like, well, what do we mean if we say a country is wealthy? And I'm going to focus on the national level, could be city level, could be community level, what have you. This question also implies what causes wealth. So what is it that makes one place wealthy? We are going to talk about how we might use the scientific method to evaluate a theory about causality. Again, we're not even really going to get into data right now, but we're going to talk about how we might set up a study and then bring in data to answer those questions. I will flag, and we'll talk about this more as we go, that this already is a study that's injecting some biases. So I have a bias, or maybe society has a bias, or maybe all of these researchers working in this area have a bias. The fact that we care about why one place is wealthier than another might itself reflect some priority we have about uh, what, what we all ought to be doing with ourselves. Maybe we should, I'm implying we should all aim to be wealthier. Of course, we might be saying, well, we care about wealth of countries because that means that people are healthier or have access to healthcare or education or other things we think are good. But generally speaking, there's something normative in here where we're assuming in this study that being wealthier is better. So that's the idea of the substantive expertise of the philosophical components of data science. It's just asking this question is injecting all kinds of ideas about what we all ought to be doing in the first place. All right. So the first thing we want to say, and the first thing you all might be shouting at me as you go is, well, what do we mean by wealth? If I'm asking the question, why are some countries wealthier than others? Boy, what's wealth? Well, there are lots and lots of different ways that uh, we have turned the idea of national wealth into a number. One big area is economic prosperity. Probably when I started introducing this topic, this is what you thought of automatically, right? And if I were in a class, I would say, what are some common measures of economic prosperity in a country? And students will say, G GDP, gross domestic product. Or maybe you'd say, GDP is not quite right. We need GDP per capita or GDP per capita based on purchasing power parity, or we need the distribution of GDP. How many people have most of it <laughs> and, and how many, uh, how, how much wealth do the, the you know, lower 80% have? Maybe you'd go away from GDP and you'd say, I actually care about um, the percentage of people in a country who are millionaires and above, or billionaires and above, or the reverse. What percentage of this population is below the poverty line? And there are lots of ways we could define that. The key idea here is that these right here are four huge different studies we could do. Um, eh, the first two aren't that different, but they would require different variables. And knowing something about how national wealth is calculated, knowing something about what all of these things mean is helpful. So we're not going to get into GDP here, but this is where substantive expertise in economics would be helpful. Uh, maybe we say forget the money itself, and we actually want to mean wealth in terms of employment rates. All of these kind of tap into different areas. And so anytime we use one data set, we are saying, okay, I'm going to measure this in terms of GDP, uh, or I'm going to measure this in terms of employment rates, but I'm necessarily leaving out some others. But maybe, as I said before, we care about wealth because we care about what it gets us. And maybe we hope that wealth gets us something like health or well-being which is kind of its own question, and I'm making some assumptions. So if I say what makes a country wealthier, maybe I mean wealthier in terms of happiness or health, so maybe I mean the lifespan. Maybe I mean the mean lifespan, maybe I mean the med median lifespan, and so on. Maybe I want to measure something like um, what decreases deaths from infectious disease. I want to measure incidences of chronic illness, child mortality rates, mental health, and so on. There are tons of different ways that I could go about even measuring this idea of wealth. 
the key thing is that just like asking this question revealed my own biases and priorities and ideas about what's important and what's worth studying and maybe what we all should be working towards, the way I define my terms is also going to reflect what I think is important. So if I'm saying, yeah, when I say wealth, I mean money, <laughs> that says a lot about who I am, as opposed to when I say wealth, I mean in terms of health. And the word wealth does tend to refer to money, but it doesn't have to, right? Um, it may also reflect the availability of data. There's a lot more data out there on GDP as opposed to rates of mental illness in different countries around the world. And that itself may reflect our priority on money versus mental health. Okay. So suppose we stick with the air quotes simplest measure. Well, it turns out that if you spend any time measuring how we measure, uh, if you spend any time looking at how we measure gross domestic product, it's actually a really complicated thing. Again, we don't need to really uh, worry ourselves too much, but just to illustrate, there's an equation that we use uh, and then we can choose to adjust it uh, or, or, uh, or not based on inflation. And we also don't really care about things that might generate higher GDP that could be bad for the country long term, like terrorism or oil spills, which can actually increase GDP. So it's an imperfect measure by by many uh, in many regards, but uh, suppose we use it, right? Well, now we want to know, okay, what do I think is going to cause GDP to go up in addition to oil spills and terrorism? All right. Well, maybe countries that are more politically stable have more wealth. Maybe it's natural resources that contribute to wealth. Maybe it's being peaceful. That means you have a higher GDP. Maybe it all depends on having friendly neighbors. Maybe it's about domestic crime rates. Maybe it's about how much investment we're doing. Maybe it's about property rights. Maybe it's about rule of law. Maybe it's a religion or cultural story and so on. Or maybe it's just luck. Maybe it's just by luck. Some countries got on the path towards wealth and it's many and some didn't. All of these are areas that have been researched quite a bit. We're not going to delve into this right now, but uh, these are all things that various smart, thoughtful people have posited and evaluated as possible drivers of national wealth. And of course, you could add many more. Probably when I first introduced this topic, I said, what causes some countries to be wealthier than others? You probably had some flash ideas. Um, so again, shout them out. All right. Now, of course, complicating things further, and you may have thought of this as I went through the list, um, many of these probably influence each other, right? So the more politically stable a country is, the more wealthy it is, but the more wealthy it is, probably the more politically stable it is. If people are well off, maybe they're less likely to take to the streets and start fighting because they stand to lose or they're too busy at their jobs, whatever, right? All right. So this can even make it harder to figure out what to focus on if we really wanted to say, I want to enact a policy to increase wealth in a country. All right. So uh, suppose I focus just on political stability. Well, this is tricky, right? Now we say, well, how do we measure political stability? Suppose I wanted to create a data set that had one column that was GDP and one that was political stability, and I wanted to see if they go together. Well, how on earth do we measure political stability? We're going to talk more about this um, in what would be, would be week six if we were following a semester schedule. Feel free to watch at whatever speed you like. So we are going to assume we figured out a way to measure national stability. Maybe we said um, uh, no violent coups in a certain amount of time. or But even then, it's like, well, what's a coup? What's violent? It's very tricky. All right. Suppose we have that perfect data. We are going to use the old scientific method to actually figure out whether or not our thinking around what causes a country to be wealthier than others is right. So I'm going to make an observation some countries are wealthier than others. And again, this is the steps that we're going to walk through every time we work with the data set. So observe, whoa, this country seems wealthy. According to whatever measure I care about, this country seems not so much. Why? What happened, right? Maybe I start with my own theory. I say, well, I think political stability is the story here. It also might be many, right? But suppose I say political stability is the one I'm really going to hang my hat on, right? So I'm going to say political stability causes countries to be wealthy. I'm going to make a causal statement in my theory. It doesn't have to be causal, but typically that's a that's a good way to start. All right. Then I might say, well, what is it about political stability that causes countries to be wealthier, right? I take my why and I drill down even further. Oh, well, because political stability allows for long-term investment, maybe in domestic projects, maybe people are investing in things, maybe other countries are investing in that country because it's stable, okay? This Y, this drilling down from my, hey, I think X causes Y, but what is it about X that causes Y? 
is a very important term that we'll come back to again and again, and I hope lives in your brain rent-free for the rest of your lives. It is the causal mechanism. My high, high fancy definition for the causal mechanism is it's the thing that causes the thing to cause the thing. It's why something causes something else. What is it about political stability that causes wealth? Many people say, oh, going to college causes getting a higher paying job. What is it about going to college that gets us a higher paying job? Is it the things that we learn? Is it the networks that we form? Is it the credential on our resume? Is it something else? That's the causal mechanism. And every mechanism you can drill further and further and further down. But even just going down one level can help us really improve our studies and our thinking. Um, so I encourage you to, to drill down to the causal mechanism or mechanisms as much as you can. Even if you don't investigate them, it really can help steer your ship in terms of where to look and how to thoughtfully draw conclusions. Why is all the way down? All right. Well, we can't really test this particular theory. Um, and I'll put a link to where to read more about causal mechanisms. We can't test out of the gates. Political stability causes countries to be wealthier. But we can form a hypothesis that would shed light on whether our theory is on the right track. So my hypothesis one is I'm going to say, if I'm right, if my theory is right, my null hypothesis is that there's no relationship between stable countries and wealthy countries. If I find that it's really I don't see any relationship between wealth and stability, I don't feel great about my theory. If I see that there is some kind of a relationship and we might just be looking at a correlation or an association, that doesn't prove my theory. We can't prove a theory, more on that to come. But it does say, huh, okay, maybe I'm on the right track. Let's go further. That's where our causal mechanism will help us out. All right, I might form another hypothesis. I might say countries that are more stable have higher levels of investment. So hypothesis one here shows that we're just finding that X and Y go together. Uh, hypothesis two says that, well, actually, we can show that as one increases, the other increases. So similar idea, slightly different patterns that we're looking for. Then I'm going to get in there and I am going to test. I'm going to design my test, either generating or collecting data. I'm going to spend a lot of time cleaning that data, getting it ready for me to use. Uh, that's going to be a huge part of your life as a data scientist. My students never believe me until they go out in the real world and then they come back and they say, you were right. I spend way more time cleaning data than, you know, analyzing data. It's true, typically. And then we're going to conduct whatever, say, statistical analysis we think is appropriate, um, probably multiple. Um, and there's no hard and fast rule about knowing for sure which one is right. Um, usually you're choosing between a number of options, and then you can argue with other data scientists about whether you chose the right one. Update our theory. We'd say, okay, wow, maybe, maybe we're right. So we saw that indeed, for example, stable countries are more likely to be wealthy. But what about endogeneity? One type of endogeneity is, and again, we'll get to these terms, but this is to preview what we're going to be thinking about as we go. This is the scaffolding of everything we'll fill in as we go, is when X causes Y, but Y causes X. So I do see a positive relationship between stability and wealth, but is it stability that's causing wealth or is it wealth that's causing stability or is it both? How might we go about studying that further? Under what conditions? Maybe it is the case that stable countries are more likely to be wealthy, but only in the presence of other particular conditions. Maybe our theory only works if we measure GDP and political stability according to number of coups. But what if we measure political stability in terms of the average person's satisfaction with the government? And we measured wealth in terms of the percentage of the population that are above the poverty line. Would we find the same result? The reason I bring this up in such gory detail right now is A, to give you a sense of this workflow so that you can internalize it, and B, to flag something very important and very, in my view, underappreciated in the world of data science, which is that data only plays a role in a few of these stages. So it plays a role with the observation stage. Hey, this has gone up. This has gone down. I see a gap between these countries and that country. And then we use it again for the test. In between all of that is us thinking really hard about what might be going on in the world, drawing from our own expertise, our own gut instincts, talking to others, reading existing research, hammering things out a bunch of different ways to see what feels most compelling to us, and then testing it. So data is really only involved in some of the steps that we're doing here. And sure, we'll use it again when we update our theory because it's gonna tell us, uh, you know, oh, let me, let me try different measures uh, and so on. So that's the general arc of what we're gonna be doing in this course. A lot of the data science I see among my clients, I do corporate consulting in data science, um, tends to stop at the observation stage. We say, wow, uh, turnover went down this quarter. 
or employee engagement went up this year. That's the observation stage. Why did it go up? Is it going to keep going up? What might we do to make it go up further? Are all things that we want to go from there. So observation is often the starting point. All right, enough from me for now. I'll see you next time.